content, so I hope you guys really appreciate it. They're going to be gone uh, pretty, pretty quickly, so give them a round of applause and we'll get started. All right. Well, this is uh, ADR is coming, hide your shit. And uh, this used to be a 90 minute talk, then we cut it down to 45 minute, now we cut it down to 25 minutes, so yeah, it's gonna go pretty fast. <laughs> uh, so I'm Michael Leibowitz, uh, Rukula in the Twitters. I'm a principal troublemaker at uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, and uh, you know, what we say is uh, not uh, endorsed by our employer or the opinion of our employer in any way. And, uh, and uh, I'm Topher Timson. I do a lot of uh, C Sharp malware stuff. I'm a principal vulnerability enthusiast, also on the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Red Team. And uh, if it's not obvious from our matching attire, we just really want to uh, write malware and drink coffee, but in the other order. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go through the uh, agenda real quick. Remember, we're going fast. Uh, what is EDR? We're going to talk about uh, firmware, and then some Windows bullshit, and then some Linux bullshit, and then we're going <laughs> to figure out what life means. Uh, there's going to be some recommendations, what we might do in the future, and then uh, conclusions, which I guess is also what does it all mean. Okay, so what is EDR? So uh, EDR stands for Endpoint Detect and Response, and basically you can read that, but uh, what it means is the blue team is going to roll you up and throw you out, and it's just going to make your life hard. Uh, some prominent uh, vendors are mentioned at the bottom of the slide. Uh, not going to mention any particular vendors, but if you're wondering, does this work on vendor? It, it does. Uh, if you're not already familiar, this is the MITRE attack framework. So uh, this is a set of tactics and techniques, and basically, I think what we need to think about it is this is by basically a uh, behavior chart for bad guys. It's just like kindergarten. Every time you do one of these things, you get a little, you get a little gold star. Every time you, uh, you know, credential dump, etc. And this is how EDR maps what you do to uh, what you do. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I think in in infosec we talk a lot about risk and we talk about the risk curve and I. Th and we're going to talk about the other risk curve. Um, so basically, no, nothing good lasts forever. You know, at this part of the graph, I don't know, does my pointer show? Oh, it kind of does. So, you know, you know that feeling, like your initial shell popped, woohoo! But this is like where you're pretty likely to get popped. And then, uh, and then, you know, basically, if they haven't caught you by now, they're not going to catch you. And, you know, you start your persistence phase and it goes and goes, but no breach lasts forever. And eventually, eventually, eventually they're going to catch you and that's, you know, that's, we want to, we want to live for longer. And the end result of that is everyone's having a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> you, your, your lovingly crafted payload becomes their sample and months of work are down the drain, everyone's Friday is ruined, the, the, this sucks, what can we do about this? <laughs> so we need, to, we need to make the, the, we need to flatten the risk curve, you've heard that before, right? We want, you know, we can't make the initial shell popped being less likely to get detected, but maybe we can flatten out that, there, that persistence phase, give you a little bit longer to enjoy your good time. And you know, as I said, nothing lasts forever. You will somewhere, somewhere over there get popped. So how are we gonna make that risk curve flatten such that we're no longer being detected after our initial shells popped? Well, we're gonna utilize a little thing called uh, UEFI. If you're not familiar with UEFI, this is essentially what uh, people refer to as modern day BIOS. It's a, a platform firmware that does all of these things, and this chart is included because once upon a time, John Lucades during a Black Hat talk said if any researcher is talking about UEFI, you have to include this slide, so here's the slide. Um, <laughs> ba basically, it's, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's platform firmware. It's what essentially um, sits, uh, it, it helps boot the processor, so it does all of, like your memory training, your CPU in it, all of those things uh, is, UEFI does all of it. It also boots option ROMs from PCI devices and whatnot. You've likely seen like the low jacks uh, finding that came out earlier uh, last year where it was a, a thing called a boot kit. So this is malicious firmware, malicious code running in platform firmware. That's where this all happens. 
Uh, the interesting thing to take out of this eyesore of a diagram is this notion of runtime. So once the operating system boots and you've been handed off to the operating system bootloader from UEFI, you expose runtime services. So these are runtime services that are exposed by the platform firmware that are available to the operating system during the runtime of the platform. Um, things that are in this category are like UEFI applications. Nobody really uses those, who cares? And then UEFI uh, platform firmware variables. So these are persistent storage variables that are in NVRAM on your platform. AK, if you restart your operating system, they're always there. They're persistent in firmware where nothing can see you. EDR has no idea what it is. No, no AV vendors and, even know this exists. And let's be honest, if you didn't know anything about UEFI, this chart wouldn't help you. <laughs> <laughs> so why UEFI variables and why are we going to focus on platform level? Well, nothing is actually looking at UEFI platform um, firmware right now from a security vendor perspective. Like EDR and AV products are kind of starting to. They've talked about doing it, but nobody really does it well. And we can essentially just stash payloads in platform firmware in these UEFI variables and evade basically everything. No, nobody, nobody looks here. Uh, so basically what happens is you can take a name, so in this case like a test name, uh, and then a thing called a GUID, and it becomes essentially a tuple that can be looked up by the platform firmware in order to pull that, that variable out of NVRAM, which contains a bunch of data. And then there is variable attributes, in this case, uh, non-volatile, boot service accessible, and runtime accessible. And you need that in the Windows environment in order to have persistent storage and pull it. Uh, you can read the UEFI spec if you want to know more. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. So there's a couple of types of UEFI variables. You've probably heard of authenticated variables before. These are variables that are backed up with X509, uh, AKA secure boot. Uh, secure boot, everything lives in an authenticated variable. That's where your PK, your KEK, and your uh, DB keys and whatnot are. So the things that actually sign, uh, like the bootloader, that's where, that's where they're stored. Uh, but what we care about is unauthenticated variables because there's no verification on write. There's no, there's no verification. They're not, they're not signed. Uh, and the majority of variables on your platform are actually unauthenticated. So to anybody looking, it's benign whatever. There, there, there's things there. We, nobody knows they exist. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, UEFI stuff on Windows and on Linux. Because it's platform firmware, it's also platform agnostic. So every single operating system is, is using it. And there's other forms of UEFI, like we're going to talk about the UEFI that's uh, published by Intel, but there's also like Core Boot, which is Google's version of it that runs on like Chromebooks and whatnot, but we're focusing on uh, x86 platforms, so it's UEFI. So UEFI in Windows is somewhat peculiar. So they actually took it away uh, in like early versions of Windows 10. And my background before leading uh, and doing red teaming stuff was uh, platform firmware research. So when I was reading through some MSDN articles and I saw release notes on Windows 10 1803, uh, they reintroduced the get and set firmware variable uh, API. Uh, and it had this long list of requirements. So it had to be uh, you have to have the special token, it has to be an admin app, it has to be signed by the Microsoft Store in order to actually execute on a box. All, all, all these requirements, there's a little URL you can go and see all the things that are required. Uh, turns out, as hackers, you don't actually have to worry about any of that shit, it all works. <laughs> so here's a really quick example, and we're flying through this, it's a lot of, we've got to talk fast. Uh, there's get and set firmware variable um, APIs that once you bypass all of that bullshit that Microsoft says you need that you don't need, you can do these things. So I said that a UEFI variable has a name and a GUID tuple, so those are the first two arguments. Basically when you're setting, you just say I want to have this name and this GUID, and then you give it the, the payload. We're going to call it a payload because it's not data, it's, it's our malicious payload. And you just say write that to a firmware variable with this GUID and this, this name. And then when you pull it, it's similar. You just give it a memory address over here in the ether that you're going to have like as RWX memory page. You'll pull that firmware variable out, which is your payload, and then you're going to run it as like a raw memory pointer. Um, so you can do that in C++. Uh, hilariously enough, the MSDN article is a little bit right when you're talking about C++ and you need some of those uh, requirements in that long list. Um, so that kind of sucks. In C++ too, if you're at all familiar with how EDR and AV works, obviously if you're doing things like virtual protect, virtual alloc, um, and any of those calls to make RWX memory, uh, AV typically at this point in time is like, whoa, you can't actually do that, that's malicious, nobody does that, 
I, you know, blue team hunts you down and it's already over. So in C sharp, because of <laughs> the notion of uh, like just in time compilation, everything's RWX. So sweet, free RWX memory for execution. Uh, nothing really ever looks at C sharp apps from an AV perspective. Like they'll look at strings and signatures of P invoke, which I'll get to, but you can basically not worry about any of that either. Um, furthermore, there's a bunch more stuff that makes C sharp great, like bypassing WDAC is really easy, like sign code in C sharp, whatever. Uh, there's tons of tools that you just compile and run. Uh, Spectre Ops guys have a lot of stuff on their blog about that. Um, and furthermore, like we're red teamers. We want to make things easy for our red team friends, so C Sharp is like the language of choice right now since nobody uses PowerShell anymore. Um, and there's reference code for both in the repo, which we'll show after the talk. So basically, if you want to write a UEFI variable to stash your payload and hide your shit, you still need this SE system environment name token. So this is a case where you do have to P invoke, you just have to get a privilege token. Um, that's pretty benign, a lot of apps do that, so EDR doesn't really care about that. You then get the address of your pin buffer in C-sharp, which is your payload, and it has to be pinned because basically in order to do this, you have to go from unmanaged to managed code, or from managed code to unmanaged code in C-sharp. So if it's not pinned, uh, the garbage collector treats it diff differently, so a little, little C-sharp fun for you. Um, then you can just write the UEFI variable with, uh, with a GUID and, and name tuple, and then it's in your platform firmware for forever. So here's code to set it. It's, it's all in the repo. Basically, you, you p invoke, set privilege, you obtain that SE uh, privilege token, and now you're a privileged app. You then get the address of the pin buffer in C sharp, so that's really easy too. It's, it's basically a couple of uh, reflective calls to like interop services. So in this case, I'm just pinning uh, a payload, which I'll show you in the demo. It's basically, for examples here, it's just going to be like a meterpreter. Super exciting. And then you write the UEFI variable. So here I have the variable name and the GUID. So there's my tuple. I give it the payload, and then it just writes it into uh, my UEFI platform. Um, so because I was saying UEFI platform uh, NVRAM is persistent across everything, so you can erase the operating system, and that's still going to be there. So you might not actually have the persistence mechanism to execute that payload, uh, but it's, it's still going to be there. So that's, that's pretty cool. It's a nice artifact of, of this attack. Um, so to execute it, it's pretty similar. You still need that token, and you need a couple of other, I'm going to hand wave things to get around. So like, for example, persistence. We're not giving you a new persistence mechanism here. It's arbitrary. It's whatever you want it to be. Um, pick your favorite. I know all of you red teamers out there have, have fun tools to do this. So basically, you still need the token. Um, in this case, we're going to p invoke that RWX memory stuff and then obtain the UEFI variable with uh, get uh, firmware environment variable ex and then execute it. Uh, but actually, I was lying because uh, we can't p invoke. I already told you that you don't do that. Hilariously enough, I've done a lot of p invoke stuff and C sharp malware um, writing in the past. I actually spoke at DevCon 23 on a on a C sharp like malware framework thing that I built. So I, I already knew this, but when this came out, uh, OJ's tweet, he was working on some CLR interpreter stuff, so I had to include it. Basically, if you're writing C-sharp malware, don't use p-invoke. It's the proverbial sin, and EDR is going to find you. And obviously, we're trying to hide our shit and not get found. So instead of p-invoking, what you're going to do now is you're going to reflectively obtain RWX JIT memory, because everything in C-sharp after it gets just in time compiled is RWX. So that's, that's a total freebie. I love it. Um, we'll still write uh, in the same way. But we're going to now write reflectively, and then we're going to execute the method. So I'll show you what that looks like in code, because I know that's a lot. So basically, if you're not familiar with what C Sharp or in reflection is, uh, C Sharp's great in that because it's an intermediate level language, it has to get just in time compiled, and all of that becomes RWX memory, because they don't clean anything up once it's been jitted. And if you look at the implementation of how C Sharp does this, you basically wind up with this huge method table that has these JIT stubs for all of the class's methods. Um, so basically, with reflection, you're, you, can, you can reflectively obtain and look at the, the program, grab all of those methods that you want, dereference the JIT stub, force the just-in-time compilation process to happen on that JIT stub despite the fact it's not going to be executed, grab that as a memory pointer, overwrite that memory pointer, and then call it like it's a real method. Follow, following me? Okay, I'm going to show you some code. 
Um, so this is now, instead of p-invoke, this is step two. We're going to reflectively attain RWX chip memory. We're going to define a method. We're going to JIT it. And then we're going to overwrite that pointer. So this is real easy. I'm just going to define a method to overwrite. It does nothing. Overwrite me. And there's also a blog post on this if you're not following along. So take a picture. The slides are public. Um, then you're going to JIT the method. So here I just reflectively get uh, the overwrite me method. And then I get the, the method handle to it. And once I have the method handle, I can do a runtime helpers prepare method, and that forces the just-in-time compilation process. And then I can dereference that method handle to the raw function pointer, and that raw function pointer is the assembly code that's going to get executed um, on, by the processor. So that's pointer to method now. So then when I write the, when I read the UEFI variable that's already been stashed by my uh, writer binary, I can now give the variable name in GUID tuple. I can use the pointer to method, which is reflective RWX memory that's been jitted. And then I can execute the method. And I don't have to like use any weird like assembly voodoo here like you'd have to do in C++. Because overwrite me now points because I overwrote it in that reflective stub. Uh, it, obta it actually has the shell code now from the UEFI variable. Uh, so EDR and AV doesn't see shit. So here's the demo. I'm going to obtain a quick shell on the target. This is all hand wavy. It's going to go real fast because Mike still has to talk and we have like eight minutes left. Go, go, go. So here, there's the demo. I'm going to speed it up. So what I just did is I'm on a Windows box. I just ran a thing called Chipsec. It's a platform uh, security tool that allows you to basically audit firmware variables and audit your UEFI platforms. Uh, check it out. It's awesome. So I just ran a module that's essentially dump all of the UEFI variables. You can see them all. You can see which ones are authenticated, which ones aren't, what the attributes of them are. I can go through and dump them all. You can see that there's you know, a variety of different variables and they all have data. So like this is a test, for example. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that write UEFI C sharp executable. I'm going to write a new variable. Um, so this is how I'm stashing my payload. So I just wrote it. I'm stashing my payload. You can see now I have a new variable that's in the platform C sharp UEFI. I can go through and actually list what the data is. So like I said, it's just going to be like a meterpreter payload. Uh, there's the payload. It's just data within UEFI. Uh, and at this point, you might with that writer binary, AV and EDR is going to catch you there probably because like we said, we're just trying to flatten the risk curve. The initial shell pop, that's when they're going to catch you. Um, but once that pat, uh, payload and persistence is all in UEFI firmware variable space, yeah, they don't, they don't see you anymore. And that's what we want. So here I'm going to come over and do uh, write uh, read C sharp. So this is going through all the reflective magic, um, and that's going to execute the UEFI variable with uh, the reflective properties that I just described. And then I can come over here, and you can see that my, my shell opened. So it, it gets better. So because this is a platform firmware, it's persistent across reboots. That variable is always going to be living there. Um, I'm rebooting the VM just to showcase that that payload is still going to be executed once the machine pops back up. Uh, it's a cooking show. It's baking. The VM's booting. And there we go. It, it just reran. It's in platform firmware. Come at me, EDR. Uh, so that's the demo. Uh, what about EDR products? Well, like I said, they don't see any of this. They might see the initial write binary, uh, but that's about it. No EDR is looking at UEFI variables, nor is AV. The persistence mechanism, like I said, is hand wavy. Uh, Y'all know how to bypass persistence mechanisms and not get caught. Um, furthermore, like EDR is pretty garbage. You can just sinkhole all of it anyway. So I, I sinkhole EDR within my UEFI payload. Um, so like ev even if they're turning it back on, uh, it gets disabled once the platform boots. And it's being disabled from UEFI platform payloads. Um, then some references. Uh, and that's, that's the Windows stuff. Mike has like five minutes to talk about Linux bullshit. All right, so uh, that was awesome Windows bullshit. I don't understand any of it. And anyone, anyway, everyone knows that all the real loot is on Linux anyway. Instead of Interpreter, we got a full weaponized payload, so uh, this is going to go pretty fast. <laughs> okay, so if we think about the problem space, basically we have EDR. EDR is looking at your, you know, looking at your uh, payload, which just became their sample. The important thing to notice here is that the EDR and your payload, because you're running as root, right? 
uh, are basically peers. There's a little bit of a kernel interface that the EDR uses to, um, to look at what your sample is doing, but basically, you know, this is an even playing field. So what can we do about this? Well, we can show up early and sucker punch the EDR, and it becomes our payload, and it's looking the other way. So how are we going to show up early? Well, let's, let's talk about how your computer boots. Um, we know that it boots at the firmware, and that's signed by the OEM, and we can't infect that. That's a bummer. And then uh, the shim boots, which is signed by Microsoft, that's a bummer. And then grub boots, and it's signed by the distro, that's a bummer. Uh, and then the kernel boots, which is also signed by the distro, bummer. Uh, the RAM disk, though, uh, is unsigned and generated on the system, so it looks normal to generate a RAM disk on a system, and there's no verification. I like it. And sometime later, EDR shows up. So obviously, we want to land where the happy face is. <laughs> so what, what techniques do we have to, uh, to, to, to control execution of the EDR? Well, we have ptrace, and ptrace is great. It lets you, you know, read and write memory and control the registers, but the problem is that ptrace is usually prohibited by policy. The good news is policy is applied by user space. That's great. Okay, so let's think about how, how this works in context. So first thing is system boots, you have PID1, it's in the RAM disk space. It execs uh, into the rootfs land, that's system D, it's also PID1, it loads the policy and the EDR. The thumbs down is the policy and the eyeballs are the EDR and then you, know, you get rolled up and that's no good. Uh, so what other APIs do we have to use? We have FA notify, FA notify is like an AV API, so we're just gonna use that for evil. Um, lets you uh, intercept file opens and then hold them to decide if it's okay or not. Uh, and then we have memfd create. We don't want to leave anything running on, you know, leave any payload on disk, so uh, we'll just make a file descriptor in memory that looks, that, that looks like a file but is not one. And then this is like some black magic fuckery that's in the code that you can, you can just look. Look in the code for black magic fuckery and you'll find this part. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a daemon. Uh, you can see the little, the little daemon face in, in the boot flow and we're going to do that and it's gonna span RAM disk land and, uh, and, and rootfs land and it's gonna open the UEFI firmware it's gonna grab out stage two of the payload, so stage one is the daemon. Then system D is gonna exec, and it is going to stop the policy load from applying that prevents our malicious action. Then we're going to inject into the EDR platform, that's stage three. And how are we gonna do that? We're, well, we're gonna ptrace, which is gonna stop us right on the edge of a system call. Then we're gonna control EAX and we can coerce by single stepping system calls. So we'll make a page <coughs> that looks like a file. We'll put, our, we'll put our malicious library in there. We'll map another, we'll coerce another page and we'll put our shellcode in there and then we'll return to DL, or we'll return to libc with the DL open, with libc's internal DL open. And then we'll return back to wherever the EDR was. Great, so now, the EDR is infected, it can't see us, and we load the policy, so everything looks fine, but it can't see our payload. See, the eyeballs are looking the other way. Uh, this is the Linux demo. Uh, we have like a minute 30 remaining, so I'm just gonna uh, let it rip and you're gonna figure out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, how do you computer? <laughs> Open with VLC, go, go, go. It's running. oh God. Computers are hard. Okay. I had to do this. I had to do this at DEF CON 2. He still doesn't know how to use computers. Okay, so we got the analyst on the right, the hacker on the left. We're gonna tune up uh, AuditD as our example EDR. Whoa. Uh, so we t tune it up, you can see a bunch of noise there. The analyst sees you. Uh, we're gonna exploit to get an enterprise tool to get root. You can see we're root. You can see like we're making noise. Oh no, then we're gonna have a bad day. Now we're gonna overwrite the um, uh, the RAM disk and infect the UEFI. You can see it makes noise. You saw that initial part, you might get caught. Everything's infected, have a nice day. <laughs> uh, then we reboot, cooking show, cooking show, cooking show. Go, 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 go. Okay, we tune up audit here. 
And you can see we're back at the analyst on the, on the right and the hacker on the left. Then we set our marker there. We set our marker so that our payload knows not to, um, not to look at us. And then you can see that, uh, that we have our marker. It's timer slack namespace. And we can exploit things. And you can see it's not making any noise in the, in the EDR. And we are totally silent. And we're doing all of our, our bad stuff. And then, ta-da, this is where you clap. It's hard because there's no shell pop, right? <laughs> it's, just, it's just nothing happens. Uh, OK. So what does this all mean? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Computers are hard. Uh, this, is, this yields a net increase in overall happiness. You're happy. <laughs> the analyst is happy. Everyone is going to have a pleasant, a pleasant Friday evening. All right, uh, we're out of time, so mitigations and recommendations, like, basically, you're fucked. Uh, <laughs> all right, so there, there's some future work. You, we'll, we'll talk to us outside about what it is. Basically, we now have a net increase in happiness. We've flattened the risk curve. We're not going to get detected once our shells pop. We're going to have a UEFI dot party, and we're going to plunder away our loot like it's the 90s again. Um, there's a lot of code on our uh, GitHub repo. Um, we're a perturbed platypus, or as every uh, awesome malware duo needs, an APT name. Uh, and in this case, we're APTPP. <laughs> uh, we can talk about that outside. Uh, so that, that's all we got. There's some references. Uh, thank, thank you very much. All right. If uh, anyone has any questions for them, let's, let's move it outside. Um, and thanks for your time, everyone.